Welcome. It has just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 30th of June, and you're watching episode 13 of Regional Wrap. Regional Wrap, providing an insight to the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and rejoining me on this episode of part two, what geology real reveals about the climate is my guest, Dr. Robert Fagan, a geologist of more than 40 years and more than 20 years experience teaching and lecturing at Curtin University. Robert has a PhD in geology and geochemistry. He's run extensive courses on various aspects of geology as the study of the Earth's history to both the general public to industry. The study of the Earth's history includes the climate and atmospheric history of ev and the evolution. Dr. Fagan is an author of a, re a recently published first year university level textbook on geology available by the, on the web, Understanding Ge Geology. Welcome back, Robert. Well, thanks very much, Bill. Um, Basically, uh, what I want to do is continue on uh, from last week's session where we looked at climate development and evolution over the whole of geological time, going back to uh, about uh, 4 billion years ago and right up to the present. But in tonight's episode, I want to concentrate uh, on the most recent component of that climate history, particularly the last million years or so, right up to the present and particularly in the last 10,000 years or so, where we are, uh, where the climate has developed and that we're considered to be what our normal climate might be like and how that is changing in relation to uh, evolution of climate over time. So we're going to look at uh, that, but also I want to discuss a number of uh, other particular issues relating to greenhouse gases as climate as, as climate uh, drivers, particularly CO2 and the issues involved in that, and, and then bringing it up to the last 1 million years or so, particularly the last 10,000 years or so of climate history on Earth. So I'll go to my first slide here, which should be this one. And uh, I'll just get rid of something there. And I'll just bring up my mouse pointer if I can, so I can. Now, this is a diagram that I um, introduced last week, and I just want to briefly revisit it. Uh, first of all, as a bit of a recap from people who saw last week's episode, but also to bring up people who haven't seen last week's episode, bring them up to speed in relation to what we talked about a bit last week before we get on to the new material for this week. So basically what we see on the screen here is a couple of charts. The upper chart, which I'm highlighting there, is basically a chart of temperature going up the vertical axis here against time from the beginning of the Earth, where my cursor is at the moment, 4.6 billion years ago, extending all the way up to the present, where my cursor is now on the right-hand side of the diagram. So basically what we have on this diagram is temperature up the vertical axis, and today's temperature, or mean global temperature of the Earth today, is about 15 degrees. And that temperature is marked at that point there on the right-hand axis of this chart. And I've extended back from that point this horizontal line that runs all across the diagram back to the start, which shows in this illustration where the present day average mean global temperature would be in this chart. What is also on the chart is how climatic temperatures have changed over time. And those temperatures that are hotter than today, hotter than 15 degrees centigrade globally, are above that line that I've just, uh, horizontal line I've just shown you, and are represented by the yellowy coloured peaks and troughs and so on. And temperatures in pa past history, and the timing of this history is listed along the bottom here, which were lower than 15 degrees mean global temperature, uh, where the temperature line over time drops below that reference line of 15 degrees, as it does there, where the temperature drops into periods of glaciation. 
So that basically shows in summary over the whole of Earth history, how climate has varied over time. So what I'll just very briefly do is I'll, hang on, let's get rid of something in my screen here. I'll start where we are at the moment, over on the right hand side of the diagram, today basically with a mean global temperature of about 50 degrees. As we go backwards in time, getting older, the temperature rises following my mouse uh, pointer there, goes up quite to moderate values, much higher than 50 degrees, up to 20 degrees or more. And then it drops down to the point where I've got my mouse at the moment, where it then gets back to 15 and then drops lower than 15. So it gets much colder than now. And that's where we have a major glacial event. Then we come out of that glacial event by warming again a bit, another short glacial event, warming again as we come out of that, and a couple of other small glacial events going back in time. So that's giving us a sort of visual view of how uh, global temperature is varied through time for the whole of Earth history, essentially. Now, what I've also uh, put on this particular diagram are these red dots, which I'm highlighting uh, at the right-hand axis, where it says 15 degrees, and I've shown everywhere in that climate history where the Earth has achieved 15 degrees, the present day climate. So it's presently at 15. The next time it was at 15 degrees was here for a short period, dropped below that, got back to 15 there, did the same here, there, 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 and there. So there's only been about six times in Earth history for very short periods of time when the Earth's temperature has been, has been the same as it is today. And those uh, periods of time have, have coincided where the Earth's climate has uh, uh, decreased from being warmer, as I'm illustrating here in the, the diagram, and drops into a glacial episode. So we, and when it comes out of a glacial episode. So those present day 50 degree global average temperatures in the past have only occurred where the earth has been going into or emerging from a glacial event. But basically it's, it's, it's silly for people to expect our earth's climate to stick where it is today for forever. Just because this short period that we've been around, it's been hovering around that 15 degrees, it's quite ludicrous for us to sort of think that it will just stay there um, an infinite item. Well, probably a lot of people do think that the present day mean global temperature has been the mean global temperature for the Earth for most of time. They've never given it enough thought and never seen any evidence apart from the odd glaciation to know that it's been that different, but it has been significantly different. And that difference is represented, if I'm, where I've got my mouse on this diagram at the moment, you'll see a dashed line running through there. That dashed line, which is about 20 degrees on my temperature uh, uh, scale at the edge here, is where the mean global temperature of the Earth has been for most of geological time. It hasn't been at 15 degrees. It's been three or four degrees, possibly five and even more on, on occasions above that. So that dash line is a better reflection of the mean average global temperature over time than anything that's represented by today's conditions. Now what I also want to reflect, uh, mention is that the scale on this diagram is quite variable. Uh, it, it's been compressed uh, in the right, so 90% of all time is featured up here, so there's been massive compression there, and then more recent times have been expanded in order to show relevant details that we want to highlight. If we kept the time scale constant on this diagram, across the whole diagram, this diagram would have to be about two meters long in order to put the whole time scale in, particularly as this time interval here is 90% of all time, and the time from there to there is only 10%. So we need to keep that in mind. The scale is variable, and you need to be a bit careful when, you, when you're thinking about some of those issues. Now, the next thing I want to point out on this diagram is this little red rectangle here at the end. That is the um, Pleistocene-Holocene period of time. And th what that period of time is the time I want to spend a, a, a moderate amount of uh, talking about in this particular discussion. Now what I've highlighted that red rectangle there, because the lower diagram down here is that red rectangle expanded. So the, that red rectangle is expanded to show all the internal detail 
uh, along the same lines as the in terms of temperature variation, etc., over time. So that's been expanded, uh, and we're going to spend a fair amount of time uh, looking at this. It's behaving in a similar way. So starting off here at the present day, uh, and temperatures going down and up. So here we have the medieval. Uh, optimum here. The time scale down here is very different from the, the above one. So here the, the time scale go, goes from the present to only about uh, a, a bit less than two million years rather than four billion years in the top diagram. So we can see that there are repeated highs and lows. Uh, some of them are, are, are known to us, the, the medieval climate optimum, the Roman uh, uh, warming period is this, this one here I'm pointing at now, there's the Holocene maximum and so on. And then we get to this portion here where we go into the Pleistocene glaciation. So a massive amount of cooling, but even within that, there are warm bumps over time. So it goes in and out and in and out and in and out over a, quite a long period of time uh, there. So that's uh, basically the last two million years, uh, I guess. And we're going to so what, revisit this. So again. what we're looking at there in those bumps in the first part of the diagram on the left yeah. hand side yeah. is quite compressed what we're looking at today. Uh, it hasn't, it's not compressed, it's sort of been expanded a bit. So mm. for example, you can see that this uh, down the bottom here says greatly expanded. If I contracted this region here to the same scale as the left-hand side of the diagram, it would end up looking like this on the left-hand side. It would get compressed quite significantly. So it's expanded, so it looks different from here. But if the scale, time scale, was the same for the left as it is for the right, these bumps that we see here in the recent uh, time would look just like these little bumps here. So this whole amount of time here would, comp would compress down into about there if the scales were the same. So it's been, it, it's, it looks peculiar because we've expanded it in order to show some more detail in recent time uh, that we're more, perhaps more familiar with. And then uh, it, it's uh, different in scale from the main Pleistocene glaciation, which is more compressed. So that, that's a slight complication, but the scales down at the bottom in millions of years here uh, reflect the time, but it is stretched in some places and compressed in others. Okay, um, what I want to do now is look at another couple of issues related to climate. Essentially, the uh, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide relationship with CO2 in the air and in reactions in water. And that has a lot of uh, uh, relevance to things that we are concerned about in today's climate uh, uh, terms. The main reaction is this one that I've listed here, number one, this is in the air, carbon dioxide in the air reacts with water, and this is at the ocean atmosphere interface to produce this dissolved species here, which is called the bicarbonate ion, plus one hydrogen ion. Which, which is acid. So that's the reaction that happens as atmospheric carbon dioxide dissolves in water. It forms that soluble species and produces uh, a hydrogen ion. So it's producing a bit of acid in the process. Now that happens at the atmosphere ocean interface. But what also happens once uh, the, the, the species is in the water, the second reaction takes over. And this is the same species, this bicarbonate ion here. It then reacts with calcium, dissolved calcium in, in the ocean, which is a fair bit of it, calcium 2 plus. And that reaction takes place to produce the calcium carbonate, the chemical calcium carbonate, which is the mineral calcite, which produces the rock type limestone. So that's uh, the soluble component in the ocean becoming now solid at this, state, at this stage to produce limestone. And that limestone is, has a very high CO2 content in it. It's part of the chemistry in here. And limestone has about 44 weight percent carbon dioxide tied up in, in that chemical mineral. And again, some more hydrogen ion is being uh, released in this reaction. A bit more acid is being produced. Now, if we can, and this, this reaction here, number two, occurs in shallow warm water can, uh, oceans in particular, particular, and that's where dissolved uh, calcium 
uh, sorry, dissolved uh, carbon dioxide in this form by carbon iodine comes out of sol solution to produce solid limestones, solid calcium carbonate. Now, in the ocean, uh, these two reactions are occurring together, if you like. And the overall reaction can be written down here, just combining those two, and we get carbon dioxide plus water, plus calcium ions, goes to limestone, plus two hydrogen ions, two bits of acid in that reaction. Now, these reactions produce limestone, including coral limestone. Now, coral limestone would not exist without abundant CO2 in that environment. Limestone and coral limestone has to get 44% of its mass or its weight from the CO2. So it, coral limestones and coral reefs require an excess of carbon dioxide in solution in that environment in order to form. They are dependent on CO2. The reaction that produces the, the limestone component, the calcium carbonate component, um, also produces significant acid. We can see hydrogen ions in these two reactions. So in that sense, and this might surprise a lot of people perhaps, coral reefs are an important contributor to ocean acidification. Those hydrogen ions that are produced in the coral reef and limestone forming process lower the pH of the ocean. They introduce acid hydrogen ions into the ocean. So lime stones, but particularly coral reefs, are contributing to uh, ocean acidification, which is probably not known necessarily that widely. So we can see that there is uh, a fair amount of acid in, uh, being produced in this. Another thing that is surprising that I might add in here is that rainwater has a pH of five and it also contributes to ocean acidification. The ocean has a pH of about eight. So every time it rains, we add rainwater into the ocean, which has a pH of five. And that's going to lower the pH, make the ocean more acid just by the effect of rainfall. We don't seem to be overly concerned about protecting the oceans from acidifying by rainfall, but th that is what happens. Now these reactions here that I've uh, uh, illustrated here are not, uh, they're, they're, called, um, uh, they're, they're called equilibrium reactions because normally when we think of chemical reactions, we have A plus B going to C plus D and basically all the reactants, A plus B, are converted to, to the product C plus D. Uh, and that the reaction consumes all the reactants to produce 100% product uh, components. But these reactions here are uh, basically equilibrium reactions, which means that they don't go all the way from left to right. They stop somewhere in the middle. So we have some components of reactants, such as these ones here remaining, and products over, over here coexisting together. And that balance will change if we change the environment, like heating it or cooling it, or adding more reactant or removing uh, some of the product and so on. So that reaction can vary and can be manipulated at, at, because it's an equilibrium reaction. And that might become important later on when we come to some issues I want to raise. Now, I also now want to look at the relationship between CO2 and temperature and the relationship uh, that is generally described as carbon dioxide added uh, into the uh, atmosphere causes an increase in temperature and we can measure the carbon dioxide uh, content in the atmosphere and measure temperature uh, over time and we can see a correlation between the two. So here's a couple of diagrams uh, here. In this diagram here we've got time uh, along the horizontal axis here in uh, thousands of years before present and the top one here is just showing you how carbon Dioxide is varying over time in the zigzaggy pattern here, there. And then the diagram below is the same time range, the same uh, material, but this is showing how temperature is changing across that same time interval as carbon dioxide is changing. And we can see that there's a very close similarity 
between these two. We can see that CO2 is following in, in close uh, parallelism uh, to the temperature. And that led most people in the climate, um, uh, considering the climate issue, that that relationship may be or must be perhaps carbon dioxide driving temperature. It's influencing the temperature because CO2 is a, is a greenhouse gas and they're following each other. Now, what I want to show is if there is a, a, a correlation leading to causation, that in other words, CO2 is a climate or temperature driver, that should always happen. So wherever CO2 goes up, the temperature should go up. And wherever CO2 goes down, the temperature should likewise go down if it's a causative relation. If CO2 is driving the temperature. But when we look at this diagram, we see that this doesn't happen. For example, if we look at this pink area on the left here, the strip here, we can see that in this part of the diagram, uh, carbon dioxide is going down, and that should generate cooling, but down in the lower equivalent time period, uh, looking now at temperature, temperature is increasing here as CO2 is going down. That shouldn't happen if this causative relationship uh, exists. And here's another example. And this pinked uh, highlighted strip here, we can see that uh, carbon dioxide is not varying very much. It's gone up and down a little bit, but the temperature is rising very uh, consistently over that same interval as CO2 is not changing much at all. So there is no causative relationship between CO2 and temperature reflected there. And then the last one that I'll show here, the CO2 on, in this pink area here is basically staying roughly constant up here across that time interval, but the temperature is increasing very markedly for most of that time and then drops off a bit. So the relationship between carbon dioxide and climate uh, or temperature in particular there is not a st high strong correlation that suggests it's a causation involved, one's driving the other. Now that's at a, a fairly small time range here, a few, a few uh, hundred thousand or so years. If we look at a much larger time interval, the same sort of relationship, which is this diagram I'm showing over on the left here, which represents the whole of geological time, then it's a diagram I showed in last uh, week's talk. The red line here is showing how temperature is varying across the diagram as we get closer to the present time. And the blue line here is showing how carbon dioxide is varying over that same time period. And we can see that overall, for most of that time, the temperature with the red curve is roughly in that sort of position, fairly constant temperature at about 20 degrees global mean temperature. So it hasn't changed very much. But if we look at the carbon dioxide, it has gone from very high values, a few thousand ppm, down progressively and sometimes markedly down to practically zero uh, over here, and not zero, but only a few hundred ppm uh, over here on the right-hand side. Now, when we look at those two relationships, there does not appear to be any consistent uh, correlation over Earth history, most of Earth history, between carbon dioxide concentration, the blue curve, and the temperatures uh, of, uh, over that same period, the red curve. So again, it seems to suggest that there is little or no strong evidence that carbon dioxide is driving temperature. They operate somewhat independently. Now, if carbon dioxide is a driver of, of temperature in particular, wherever carbon dioxide goes up, the temperature should go up. And wherever it goes down, the temperature should go down. That is not being shown up regularly and convincingly in the data. There, sometimes is a, there is a correlation, but it's not a good enough correlation to indicate that causation is happening. One's driving the other, because there are many instances where the two depart from each other. Okay, in order to uh, uh, get a lot of information about what the climate was like in the past, particularly in the last 10,000 uh, years or even further back than that, we use uh, drill cores of ice. So uh, particularly from polar regions in the Northern and Southern hemisphere. And what happens as ice forms, the water freezes and bubbles of air are preserved in the ice. 
And here's a nice core here that this person is holding. And you can probably see it's a little vision is a bit disturbed there. That's because there are bubbles of air frozen into that ice at the time that the ice developed or ice formed. And here's an enlarged version of a bit of ice between somebody's fingers here, showing these bubbles. These are frozen in air bubbles. Now they're incredibly useful because we can, those bubbles contain um, water uh, or um, some water and gas. They represent bits of the atmosphere that were frozen in. So we can extract the content of those bubbles and we can determine from those bubbles what the carbon dioxide content of the air was at the time that, that those bubbles were frozen in uh, to, the, to the ice. And we can also measure the oxygen 1618 uh, ratio in the water in, in the ice and uh, that may be involved in some of those bubbles to work out what the temperature would have been when that ice formed. What was the temperature that's frozen in? So we can get from that and from, from those bubbles, both the atmospheric composition of CO2 and other gases, but also what the temperature was at the time that that, that ice was formed. And when we plot that information up uh, against time, we get sort of a diagram that looks like the one that's illustrated here, where we have again time stretching across uh, from uh, uh, the horizontal axis from left to right, and temperature uh, uh, and CO2 both being recorded here. Now in this uh, chart here, uh, the temperature is the red curve going across uh, from over 3, uh, 300,000 years of time up to the present. And the blue is what the carbon dioxide level was at, at, from the same material over that same interval and uh, what it was in, in uh, parts per million on the right hand axis there and the temperature on the left. Now we can see that there is this remarkable correlation between temperature and uh, carbon dioxide content. Uh, they, they follow each other very, very closely. So there is a relationship, obviously, uh, between them. And that uh, would be very convincing to suggest that one is causing the other. At the moment, or at the, the most widely held view, particularly amongst climate scientists at the moment, is that um, the CO2, uh, two, because of greenhouse effects, which we just discussed in the session last week, are, are causing the atmosphere to warm and it is uh, the CO2 is driving the temperature. So the blue line is driving the, uh, the red line uh, basically. But we, we can see there's an interesting pattern here anyway. There seems to be a very character, now at this time interval is uh, you know, three to, over 3,000 years from the, from the right to the left, we can see that there's a very significant and consistent zigzag pattern in this. It's going up and down, it's warming and cooling and warming and cooling and warming and cooling. And it's, uh, it's, it's doing it at a very regular um, pattern. It's a cyclical pattern. And that pattern has a cycle in terms of the time scale here of about 100,000 year, years. Every 100,000 years, it reaches a peak and then, then drops down. And then it goes up to the next peak and drops down and the next peak and drops down. Those peak separations or the wavelength, if you like, of this pattern uh, has a, an interval of 100,000 years. There's something cyclical happening here that happens every 100,000 years that is driving what we see in this, this type of pattern. We're right at the end here at the moment. This is where the present time is. And CO2 is really broken out here and gone from what it would normally expect to see going up to about this level to rocket up. This rocketing up here, up to 415 uh, parts per million is largely due to man-made CO2 being introduced into the atmosphere for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. So we would, without that, we would expect this to drop down again over here, but there's been a significant introduction of man-made CO2 to drive it right off the top of the diagram here. Now, what is causing this zigzag pattern? It's regular. And, and uh, it, it's, it's having a very strong uh, influence. Now, one of the main uh, possible influences 
is something that is known as Milankovitch cycles. And Milankovitch cycles are variations in the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. It's basically an ellipse, but this ellipse changes over time. And there are several changes that take place. The first change is if we assume that that, say, is a normal reference orbit of the, of the Earth around the, uh, around the Sun, periodically that ellipse extends or enlarges. And over time, it goes to this shape, the blue curve here, which means that there are periods of time now when that happens, where the Earth is much further from the Sun than when the ellipse is shorter. Now, this variation from that ellipse to the extended or elongated ellipse is called eccentricity, and that extension of the Earth's orbit around the Sun occurs every 100,000 years. So it's a 100,000 year type um, uh, repeated cycles of it. But that's not the only thing that happens. What also happens, illustrated down on the bottom right here, is the Earth's axis, spin axis, tilts. Uh, and at the moment, it's about 23 degrees to sort of being vertical to the plane of uh, the ecliptic around the sun. Uh, but it can vary. It can tilt over more or tilt back and become steeper. And that also changes the climate because at some stages, bits of the Earth are closer to the sun than they would be at other times. So that tends to largely affect seasonality, the seasons. And that variation, that varies systematically as well through cycles that last for 41,000 years. And then there's another one as well, which is illustrated up in the top here. And this is where not only the tilt exists, as down here, but that tilt uh, begins to spiral or, or rotate uh, and it spins like a top. So the axis starts to spin around like a top. It's not held in a constant position as it goes around that orbit around the sun, but it spins by itself. It's got a, a rotation to it as well. And that uh, cyclicity of that type of process happens about every 20,000 years or so. So all these things are varying how much energy uh, and how close the moon, uh, sorry, the moon, how close the Earth is to the sun at various times in these cycles. And basically the 100,000 year one here, the, the stretching of the, uh, of the ellipse is the big peaks that I'm showing at the moment there. That's about 100,000 years. So at this point here where it's hot, uh, the, that's when the earth is closer to, to the sun. That's when it's in that sort of position. And, uh, and as that ellipse extends, then we get further from the sun and we stretch out into that bigger ellipse and the temperature decreases down to here where it's furthest from the sun and has less heat rece being received. And then at the end of that 100,000 year, 100, year cycle, it starts to shorten again and get closer to the sun and it heats up as illustrated here into the next repeated cycle and so on. So there is a a uh, orbital relationship of the um, of the Earth to the, to the position, which strongly influences uh, proximities of the Sun, and therefore provides uh, the opportunity for the Earth to heat or to cool on a systematic zigzag pattern, as we've seen illustrated. So that can change, systematically change the climate over time by the Earth being at different distances from the Sun and its orbits over time. The next consideration I want to look at here is how carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere is likely to increase temperature. And here's, here I have a bar chart which has um, degrees Celsius and temperature on the uh, y-axis. And along the bottom is increasing amounts of carbon dioxide being tested in the atmosphere or in a atmosphere. By adding uh, 20 ppm increments, each of these bars is an additional 20 ppm increment of carbon dioxide into the environment and the temperature is measured with each of these increments. And what we see when we put the first uh, 20 ppm of CO2 into that, that atmosphere or that environment and measure the temperature, the temperature change 
is about looking up here is about almost 1.6 degrees. So the temperature will increase by 1.6 degrees for the first 20 ppm of CO2. If we then take another 20 ppm of CO2 and add it in, in addition to the first, the increase in temperature of, uh, caused by the second 20 ppm being introduced is only is not 1.5 or so degrees, it's now only about 0.4 of a degree increase in temperature with the second 20 ppm. Putting another 20 ppm in has a smaller additional increment of temperature and as we keep increasing these uh, uh, additional amounts each of 20 ppm into that environment the increase in temperature drops off dramatically. It's an exponential decrease in temperature as CO2 content is increased in the environment. So the accumulated effect is getting smaller. It's, it's getting smaller, but it's not only getting smaller, it's getting smaller exponentially. Hmm. So it's not halving and then halving again and, and whatever. It's more dramatic than that. So if we look at the temp if we look at the atmospheric compositions down here, so for example, if we're at 200 uh, ppm, the temperature would be, that we would see would be all of those added on, and that would give the total temperature, that would be the cumulative effect of 200 ppm. But if we then doubled that and went up to 400 ppm, which is over here, then the additional temperature from doubling the atmosphere at 200 to 400 ppm isn't to double, the overall temperature we saw before, it is to take that temperature at 200 ppm and add to it all those little increments there. So it's a- Next to nothing. Well, it, and particularly as you go on at the moment, we're at uh, atmospheric temperature of almost uh, 420 ppm. So we can see if we add another uh, 20 ppm or 100 ppm or whatever, the increment uh, in temperature caused by that is going to be minuscule. It's going to be very minor. So we keep increasing CO2, but the thermal influence is becoming insignificant. That's because it seems as though the uh, greenhouse effect with CO2 um, becomes saturated as the concentration of CO2 in that atmosphere or environment increases. So uh, uh, so we can estimate that doubling the present 400 ppm, which is where we're, we're at now, somewhere down in here, 420 or something, to 800 ppm, by introducing, for example, man-made carbon dioxide, at the present rate that uh, industrial activity is producing, it would take us 160 years to go from 400 ppm or so now to 800 ppm. So it's going to take a long time to do that. But the effective increase in global average temperature when it gets to 800 ppm is only going to be 0.3 of a degree. So we've doubled it from 400 to 800 ppm, but we've only increased the temperature by that uh, uh, doubling by 0.3 of a degree. It's a pretty small increase. Now this is, needs to be more widely known and understood. If this is true, and there's some debate about this, but if this is true, then we do not have to do anything at all to fix this non-existent climate problem. Uh, because adding more in is not going to significantly increase the temperature because it's reaching saturation levels. But the other thing that it shows is that in reverse, if we try to remove some of the CO2 in the atmosphere, these uh, CO2 or carbon mitigation programs, it's very hard to remove quite a lot to cause any significant temperature decrease. So we have to move all the way down to about here, massive amounts before we have much of a temperature change drop down as we go through that, reversing that, uh, uh, that trend there. So it's- By the time you go down to those sort of levels, every, every plant on the planet's died. Well, if it gets below 150 ppm, all, all plants will die. So if it gets below where the mouse is there, basically uh, we will kill all vegetation. There won't be enough CO2 for plants to gather together 
to, uh, to form their own cellular structure and produce a healthy vegetation. Now there's another diagram here, which uh, I won't go into, it's a fairly frightening looking one, but it, it, it's another way of explaining that same situation. So I'll leave that, we don't have time to cover and it's much more complicated, but it shows the same relationship. Now, what I wanna show in this illustration here as the effect of decreasing CO2 on the environment. So here's this earlier diagram that I've shown before, where um, basically CO2 has dropped away, the blue lines here, virtually to nothing. So it's gone down from a couple of thousand ppm, virtually down to two or 300, 400 ppm. That's a massive uh, sort of decrease. The amount of CO2 from the point where my mouse is there, to where it is against the present day situation, that's an 85% reduction of CO2 from the atmosphere at this point here in 500 million years. So we can see it's decreasing. Now we can tell by the rate of that decrease that basically in 100 million years time, there'll be no CO2 left in the atmosphere. It will have all been drawn out of the atmosphere, dissolved in the ocean, and then reacted according to those reactions I showed you earlier to produce limestone. So the atmosphere will be completely or very depleted uh, in, in CO2 and no life on earth will exist. All life depends on CO2. That's where the carbon comes from for all uh, vegetable and animal life. Once that's gone, that's it. And we're progressing towards that. We don't have to panic about it now because it'll only get to that stage where we basically have nothing much left and everything will die in a hundred million years time. So we've got a hundred million years before we need worry, seriously. But we can see that vegetation is greatly affected by this depletion of CO2 now. So this is a fairly famous uh, illustration of how CO2 controls plant growth. So here we've got a series of pictures in a greenhouse. And in this left-hand picture here, we have a tree, a particular species of tree growing um, at under ambient climate conditions. Under the present day, or at the time the photo was taken, uh, the ambient CO2 level at that time, which was 385 ppm. And that's uh, how big the tree grew with that level of carbon dioxide. The next one is another uh, uh, plant in a, in, a, in a glass house. It's the same type of tree grown at the same time over the same period of time, but it now has an additional 150 ppm CO2 in it, higher than this position. And its CO2 level is now down, written down the bottom there, it's 500 and something. And the tree is now significant, has grown significantly bigger with that higher CO2 level over the same interval of time and the same conditions than the first one. The next one over here is where the another tree grown in another glass house where the atmosphere has been has an additional 300 ppm carbon dioxide added to it compared to the first one here over the same interval of time so that the total COP as CO2 uh, atmospheric composition is 685 there and that's how big that same style of tree has grown in the same interval much much bigger and the last one here, where we've, where we've added even more CO2 uh, in it, um, 450 additional. Uh, so it's now at 835 ppm, which is more than twice our current CO2 uh, in the atmosphere level. And you can see the tree is growing bigger again. So what this is showing is that basically under the present atmospheric conditions, most vegetation on earth is starved for CO2. It's not receiving anywhere near the optimum amount of CO2 for it to have optimum vegetation growth. It's being starved. It's not being starved to death. These trees that have low uh, uh, CO2 environments aren't dying, but the effect of them is that their growth is severely stunted. You can compare this small tree or shrub here to the same species over here. Uh, there's about a, a factor of three or four difference in terms of uh, optimum plant growth. So, so something we don't tend to realize sufficiently is that the vegetation we see on earth is actually starving 
for adequate amounts of carbon dioxide. In the past, when these initial species of vegetation developed, there was much, much more. There was a couple of thousand, a thousand or more ppm atmosphere. The plants had massive exposures to more, all the carbon dioxide they needed for growth. But over time, as we depleted the atmosphere, then the plants found it harder and harder to get enough carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to maintain optimum growth. And they coped with that by shrinking in size. So they're effectively starved, but they're not dying, but they would grow far more substantially with much higher CO2 levels. Now we can see this uh, also when we look from space. So this map down on the bottom right here is, uh, is showing the uh, increase in vegetation across the globe in this color uh, scheme here in the last 40 years or so since we've had major satellite imagery that can stare down at the earth and measure the greening or the, the foliage or the vegetative cover of the earth and so what we have seen in this illustrated here by these colors is that anywhere in that map that is green, any shade of green and above in this color scheme here, the vegetation is increased in coverage by those percentage amounts. And anywhere below, yellow and, and below and not green, is either not changed or there has actually been a reduction perhaps in, in growth. But we can see over most of the earth in the last 30 years, all these green areas here, which show in some cases very dramatic, including Western Australia, a dramatic increase in vegetation, uh, in vegetation cover. And that is entirely due to the man-made CO2 contribution into the atmosphere uh, uh, over the last 40 years. It's increased the CO2 concentration and it's had a remarkably surprising increase in vegetation cover. Some places, uh, which are the darker greens in this here, they've had a 20 to 30 percent increase in vegetation cover as a result of the increased uh, CO2 put into the atmosphere over the last 40 or so years by industrial activity. So again, it shows that vegetation in particular and life in general uh, is greatly affected by atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide. Okay, I uh, want to change to a, a, another topic now. Often when people look at um, the, the uh, global warming and they, they're concerned that, well, perhaps things were warmer in the past, but would mankind, which is a re reasonably recent development, would they be able to survive if we went back to CO2 conditions and, and, and warmer conditions that may have existed before mankind existed? If we went back 10 million years or so, and looked at the CO2 and temperatures then, would hum, human beings or humankind be able to survive? And the suggestion is that they might, might not. So in this diagram here, we've got time going from left to right again. And basically we've got uh, bars here in blue, which represent various uh, uh, developments or the ascent of humans or humanoids or man over that time interval from very primitive ancestors, Homo erectus down the bottom here, extending all the way up to relatively recent times. Um, then we've got Neanderthal here, beginning at about this time here, stretching fairly close to the present, but dying out. Homo sapiens, us, started probably somewhere about here in a fairly hesitant way, but really started to take off with the mouses now uh, up to the present. Now, in the lower part of this diagram, we have this climate temperature chart that we showed you before, where we've got these various asymmetrical sawtooth patterns in temperature over time. And basically we can see, well, how has temperature varied back in time uh, compared to now when Homo sapiens and some of these precursors existed? So here we are at the present, and that's the temperature we are at the present. If we go back in time to this position here, where it got hotter than today, so where this bar is here, it's a hotter period of time, Homo sapiens were still thriving then, they weren't affected by that. Then it got a bit colder, and then the next hot period was uh, here, 
uh, and again, Homo sapiens probably started to take off at this point. So some of these temperature peaks back here are warmer than we are today. So higher temperatures than where, where we are today and higher CO2 levels in the past than we have today. And they don't seem to have affected the uh, ascent of man and the, uh, the um, development of, of humankind and human habitation on earth through those climate episodes there. So it doesn't look as though, it looks as though humans and humanoids and mankind are fairly tolerant to fairly significant uh, increases in CO2 levels and also temperatures in the past. They haven't knocked us over. They haven't basically destroyed civilization or humanity uh, over time. And the other thing would be today we're much more technical technologically advanced, we, we've got other means to help us cope with any variations. Yeah, we've got air conditioning and, and climate and, and environment management systems that uh, allow us to cope with things if they get hotter and also if they get colder. So we've got warming and, and clothing and insulation and various other things that allow us to cope much more with significant changes up and down climate in terms of warmth than we did in the past. Okay, so that, that's a fairly significant um, feature. Um, what, uh, how are we going for time there? How, long, how much longer do we have? Oh, you, with your sharing, I haven't got a time slot, time. Yeah, well, anyway, uh, here's, here's an, another uh, closer look at the recent past. So this is one of those, um, uh, sawtooth climate uh, temperature CO2 uh, charts that we had before. I've just taken a bit of it. This is the modern day position here. And I've taken this bit here, which is the last 10,000 years or so. And I've enlarged it to show the detail inside here. So this is from my score uh, data. And this is the detail over that interval from the present going back to about 10,000 years where we start going into the deep Pleistocene glacial event. So this is largely the Holocene, which is the, um, the, the, the basic, uh, basically the warming interval following the last major glaciation. It's an interglacial period. But this chart here is showing how temperature is varying as we go from emerging from the last major gla uh, Pleistocene glaciation into the Holocene over time. And we can see it's going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And it's interesting to, to note that there's a cyclical variation there. The interesting feature of this chart showing temperature is the regularity of the warming episodes, the peaks in this chart. The, every thousand years, there's a peak. And that peak lasts for about two to 300 years with warming and cooling rates of about one degree every hundred years to climb up that peak and then down, cool down the other side and climb up the next week, the next peak and so on. So there's warming events every thousand years and you've got the scale here and we can see each of these blue, uh, blue green bars is a warming peak and they're re regularly about a thousand years uh, apart. And the warming is uh, about one degree per hundred years as you climb up these peaks. Now that is the same sort of temperature that's generally being described as occurring um, in present warming, about a hundred degree, about one degree every hundred years is regarded as being pretty much the same, uh, or the warming rate at the present time. But it's the same as the warming rate in each of these cyclical warming peaks in the past. And there's been a large number of these warming peaks in the past. It's a major feature. Now it must have some cause, there must be some reason for that warming that's cyclical and it's about a thousand uh, year cycles of, of it. That would also appear to be something like uh, an orbital effect of the earth at a thousand year cycle rather than the Milankovitch ones that I talked about before. So this is a tighter, shorter cyclicity that hasn't been widely recognized, but it is likely to, be, to have an orbital effect where it gets warmer and cooler as the sun uh, and the earth get a bit closer and a bit further apart on a hundred year uh, cyclical sort of episodes. 
So that's uh, an interesting feature as well. If we look at the CO2 over that, then that bottom graph here over the same temperature uh, uh, range in, uh, of uh, that top chart, it decreases, CO2 decreases there and then increases uh, for, the, for the younger portion. So again, there's no close CO2 correlation with, uh, with temperature in that. It's not recording, these peaks are not recording um, increases in CO2 followed by temperature. They're not. You could check, but you could cherry pick certain spots along those, both of those lines where you could say there is a correlation if you only looked at that particular time spot. And that, and basically the original, um, uh, the hypothesis for the uh, catastrophic um, global warming was uh, created in, uh, in the Senate inquiry in the United States in 1986. A correlation on between about 1970 and to, to that time in 86. So while there's no correlation when you can see it over, over the whole map or the whole graphs, you can, can, if you cherry pick, finds when it's going up and down fairly, fairly close, close together. There will be some relationship between the two because although CO2 may not be driving temperature increases or decreases, temperature does affect CO2. So the warmer the temperature gets, the less soluble carbon dioxide is in the ocean, the more is uh, expelled at, back into the atmosphere. So there is a, a, a relationship between temperature and CO2, where temperature drives increases in CO2 or decreases, but it's not the other way around. So some of these peaks may be, uh, to some extent, a reflection of temperature changes affecting CO2, rather than CO2 affecting temperature change, perhaps. Again, people will debate these sorts of issues. So uh, basically uh, what I wanna do is go back to the same diagram we had before. And one of the, we can see this sawtooth zigzaggy pattern. Now, one of the issues is that we can understand using the Milankovitch cycles that getting closer to the sun with a shorter ellipse will increase temperature. So we get here with the temperature will increase as that ellipse shortens. And as, as, as that ellipse uh, starts to lengthen, it'll cool uh, over a thousand years, uh, over the um, hundred thousand years. And then it'll get the next cycle of stretching and cooling again as it contracts and so on and so forth. So we can understand temperature being affected by that to produce that pattern. But if we want to have CO2 driving climate and not temperature uh, due to proximity of the sun and the orbit, then it's hard to imagine what mechanism on earth would cause CO2 to increase and then decrease and increase the blue and then decrease and increase and decrease. What mechanism is driving that to cause temperature to follow it if we, consider CO2 as the climate driver. It's very hard to imagine any, any change, systematic cyclical variation uh, in uh, every hundred thousand years or so, we can see that spacing there, that would cause CO2 to systematically rise, where's it coming from, and then systematically decrease every hundred thousand years or so repeatedly. Especially when man wasn't there. Well, man wasn't there at all. Uh, during all and of industry this. wasn't there. So it's hard to understand what's the mechanism that's regularly and systematically increasing and then decreasing CO2 if that's the driver. We can certainly understand why temperature is increasing and decreasing because of the um, orbital changes that are taking place uh, according to Milankovitch uh, cycles in the system. Another point about this diagram here is when we get up to the right hand side here, the temperature is going up and down and up and down. CO2 is going up and down, which is the blue, until it gets to this point. And then there is this massive increase in, um, in CO2, going all the way up here to 415 ppm. Um, that is not in keeping with the previous uh, patterns. That is the man-made CO2 contribution uh, since the Industrial Revolution, particularly in more recent times, 
driving the CO2 levels way out beyond where it would normally have been expected to be. Now, what we can see is if CO2 is driving temperature, then we can see how much CO2 causes how much temperature rise. So if we go back to where I'm looking now, if the CO2, the blue line increases from there to there, then the corresponding temperature increase would be from the red line from there to there. Now that amount of CO2 increase that I've just highlighted there is the same roughly as we see there. It hasn't been, at least so far, accompanied by any equivalent increase in temperature. We would expect that the temperature in here to, to accommodate all that would have to add about eight degrees Fahrenheit, which is the distance from there to there in temperature terms. It's eight degrees Fahrenheit increase. Where is the eight degrees Fahrenheit that would need to be introduced at this point here at some stage to accommodate that same amount of increase in, in CO2? Well, maybe there's a lag and people suggest that possibly that there is a, a time uh, uh, lag between CO2 increasing and temperature increasing. But there's certainly no sign of it there. That would be a very dramatic increase to catch up. We'd have to add about, that's eight degrees Fahrenheit, which is about six degrees centigrade, uh, onto the present temperature. So this temperature down here would have to go up to here on, on, on the scale. Now that doesn't seem to have happened at the moment, but possibly if there's a lag, we might expect that in the future. I'm pretty doubtful about that particular proposition. The other thing yeah. is, I think that I think there's been other uh, investigation of, of those diagrams that you had up there, and then the sort of general uh, opinion by a lot of uh, scientists is that the, the, uh, CO2 actually lags the temperature in those diagrams by about 800 years. That's a very long. Uh, lag period, and that yeah, th that is uh, that is assumed to be the case, and maybe that might account for the fact that temperature is not. Um, uh, although, if I go back to that diagram, uh, uh, hang on, go back here. Uh, the temperature followed pretty quickly here as the CO two went up, and and here, and even in here, but it doesn't seem to have followed here. So I would expect that we should have seen something, some evidence of it without a lag. There doesn't seem to have been a lag involved in some of these other increases in these earlier uh, increases in peak, peak heights. So again, that seems to be a little bit of a concern that's not easily explained, I don't think. Okay, if we go to this next chart, which I've seen versions of before, this is the last 180 million years, that expanded one that I started off with. Uh, so it only covers, uh, goes back 1.8 million years up to the present. And it's again, the same sort of format of these charts I've shown you before. And basically it's showing you going back, there's a number of warming peaks that I'm following now with, with the orangey yellowy colors. And I've labeled them one, two, you can see blue numbers there possibly, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they go all the way over to about 15. And this continues even into the Pleistocene glaciation here. So we can see, now remember this part's expanded dramatically, we'd have to reduce that whole length to about from there, there to about there, which means it would end up looking like one of these little warming peaks here. So we can see that basically over time, the, uh, the temperature has, there's been a cyclical increase in temperature by warming periods. Um, and basically um, the earth has been, we're, we're over here and we're concerned about warming at this point, but basically we can see all through here, but particularly back into here, that the earth has gone through this cyclical warming up to present day conditions at least 15 times before. In the, class, in the past uh, million years or so, without destroying the earth or destroying life or completely ravishing the planet, it seems as though uh, the earth and its vegetation and life and everything that we are concerned about seems to cope and has coped very well 15 times with these cyclical warming episodes and is likely to do again into the future, right up into the future at the right-hand side of this diagram. It seems as though 
uh, and most geologists, I think, believe we are still emerging from the last glacial advance. Warming is returning as low global temperatures try to return to the longer term, normal warmer conditions of the past. This warming that's occurring, each of these warming humps here, is non-threatening. Seem to survive it very well in the past. It's inevitable, it's predictable, it's unaffected by CO2, it's manageable and overwhelmingly beneficial. These warming pulses have been very beneficial to civilizations and to life in general. And Most of those and warming, warming pulses coincide yes. with uh, great advances in civilization at that particular time. Uh, if, if, you, if you look at them, you know, probably the early Egyptian period, the Greek just before the Greek period, the Roman period, the and, right. and the medieval, yeah. They, they were all times of advance and the dips were probably um, periods when we sort of had problems with advancing in regards to the onset of coal probably made food food availability and uh, and other resources uh, more difficult for humans. Well, humans seem to have survived pretty well because we're going back here uh, to 8,000 years. Uh, uh, basically, this is where human, early humans start to develop, and they've survived a couple of these humps that we see here, uh, which is the medieval and the Roman optimum and going back to the early Holocene, uh, which is going back 6,000 years or so. We're looking at a, ancient Egypt and those sort of civilization going back to 8,000 years or so in here. But those, um, those peaks, we really thrived. Yeah, we did thrive. Each of these peaks is uh, where humanity and civilization prospered because life was easier, it wasn't so much of a struggle. Crops grew better, we were warmer, we didn't have to uh, be concerned about freezing to death in the winter and getting enough food to survive. That, those warmer climates allowed us to flourish. Now, it seems as though these have been going on, at least of these numbered ones here, about 15 times. Uh, and life as we know it has survived remarkably well. And these humps or regular warming pulses, so these are the ones that are about 100,000 years apart that we talked about. These are the uh, sawtooth ones and some of the previous diagrams there. They cannot be prevented. We can't prevent them from happening. If they are controlled by orbital relations between the Earth uh, and the Sun, we're not going to be able to shift the Earth orbit in order to correct some of the climate consequences of some of these changes in, in um, elliptical behavior of the earth around the sun. So when we look at this chart here, it, it seems as though nature, as I said down the bottom here, has things well under control. We don't have to do anything. We manage very well. And we probably could not be in better hands than just leaving it to nature. It's coped very well 15 times before without a disaster. And it looks as though every reason to suggest it is likely to do again in the next interval beyond the right-hand side of this, this chart. Now, this diagram here, uh, just as onto another topic, this is uh, showing basically here time along the bottom axis from the present here going back uh, 24,000 years, so it's a relatively short period of time. It's in the Holocene again, and this is showing you uh, sea level change over that time period up to the present. And we can see down on this part here at the time, this was during the Pleistocene, the last glacial maximum, during the Pleistocene, the last glacial ma maximum, and it started to warm at about this point, and it started to melt very thick sequences of ice that covered most of the northern hemisphere, well, not most of the northern hemisphere, the northern parts of Europe and North America down to at least the uh, Canadian USA border. And as that, and some of those ice sheets were two or three kilometers thick of ice sitting on top of Canada in particular. As that ice melted, as warming uh, occurred, vast amounts of melt liquid were being produced. And this is following this curve up here. And basically what happened is we uh, basically, um, the, the sea level changed by 120 meters. So the, the, the sea level uh, was 120 meters lower than uh, the present time 
uh, at, at about that time, 16,000 years ago. And as uh, melting occurred of those vast amounts of ice, the sea level got shallower and shallower pretty dramatically. It's a, it's a fairly steep um, uh, change there. Up until about six or 7,000 years ago, and from then on, uh, sea level didn't change very much. So the major amount of melting and, and, and sea level change stopped at about this point. And from this point on, about 7,000 uh, 7, years ago up to the present, the sea level has hardly changed at all. It's gone up and down and up and down by a meter or so. It goes up when we hit one of those little warming pulses that we talked about a minute ago. Uh, so melting occurs. But the sea level from that small amount of ma uh, melting is only possibly about a meter or so. And as we move off that warming hump fairly quickly, that water or excess water that melted freezes. And so sea level globally is lowered by about a meter. And then the next hump causes a small amount of melting, another meter, the next uh, uh, cooling event removes some of that. So the water for my last uh, ocean levels for the last 6,000 years or so have just been going up one meter and down a meter and up a meter and down a meter. There's not dramatic, these changes in sea level are not incremental. We're not keeping adding more and more meters. We're adding a meter and then removing as, as, uh, as we enter a small cooling pulse and, and repeatedly. So that's accommodating most of uh, the last 6,000 years or so. Sea level has been going up and down by perhaps one to two meters but not cumulatively, it's not continually to add meter after meter after meter. And Just that, as that 6,000 years uh, mm -hmm. correlates roughly with the, with the period that the Great Barrier Reef's been in existence. Yes, yeah, so, so I've got this little inset map of Australia here. When the sea level was, um, uh, during the last ice age, was 120 metres lower than where it is today, the sea, the shoreline of Australia would roughly be at the edge of the continental shelf, this light area there that I'm following around with the mouse pointer. So that's where the sea, that's where the shoreline of Australia was, uh, six or seven, uh, you know, uh, basically down here uh, when we were uh, um, under full ice conditions during the Pleistocene. The um, increase in sea level with the melting of the, the ice from the last glaciation has increased the, the, shore, the sea level from a shoreline that was out here to where the present shoreline is. So effectively 20,000 years ago we could have, could have walked to um, Hobart? Well the Aboriginals did walk across the Bass Strait. They could walk, you could walk right across. There was a land bridge uh, right across here and as, uh, as um, uh, um, things changed, then that water uh, sea level rose uh, to block that land bridge. You could also would have been able to walk from uh, northern Australia to New Guinea and from northern Australia here to some parts of Indonesia as well. There would have been a land bridge. All this white coloured area here was probably largely emergent land when the sea levels were uh, uh, 120 metres lower than they are at the moment. So that was a very dramatic change, but it was due to a massive uh, warming that occurred uh, at the end of the last ice, ice age. There. We've gone a, gone a fair bit over, um, Robert, so we'll have to just move on a little bit. It's quarter past okay. eight. Well, what are, I'm, there is no climate. Whoops, hang on, hang on, uh, hang on. I'll just go back a bit. This is my last statement. So this is my final statement here. So I'll just give this one. There is no climate problem or crisis. The geology of the Holocene, 12,000 years ago to the present, completely refutes the assertion of man-made climate change and the involvement of carbon dioxide as a climate trigger or a driver. Carbon mitigation, CO2 reduction, is unnecessary. CO2 is not a pollutant, but an already seriously depleted essential atmospheric gas. CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning are a safe atmosphere carried fertilizer delivered daily to every plant on earth for free. Coal with its contained CO2 is thereby already clean coal. 
Therefore, there is no need for green or renewable energy technologies unless competitive with existing fossil fuel equivalents. There is no climate crisis. The climate is behaving with short cyclical interglacial warming episodes normally and predictably as it has numerous times during the great many interglacial warming cycles over the last few thousand years. The climate is presently warming as it returns to a longer term warmer natural condition as the earth warms on emerging from the last major glaciation. The best place for CO2, including fossil fuel exhaust CO2, is in the atmosphere where it ultimately came from. There is no problem and therefore no solution is necessary. Science cannot solve or model a non-existent problem. If CO2 is not a climate driver, then no amount of computer modeling involving CO2 will be able to recreate past, present or future climates or make meaningful climate predictions or projections. The best and cheapest climate option with the least impact on the economy, society and the environment is to do nothing. CO2 is not a problem. The cost of inaction is zero and damage done to the economy, society and the environment would also be zero. Spending huge multi-billion dollar sums of taxpayers' money globally on massive climate and social engineering and renewable energy schemes would ruin global economies and cripple societies for no actual climate benefit. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's the end of my uh, presentation. Okay, that, that's... Just getting it to the um, nitty gritty of uh, the arguments today, it's somewhat worrying in regards to how how the um, global warming uh, alarmism came into effect back in '86 with uh, James Hansen from the Goddard Institute with NASA um, pointing out that correlation between 19 70 odd to 1986 when there was a rise in CO2 and, and a rise in temperature for that period. And that, that term, catastrophic uh, anthropogenic global warming, stuck for a period of, and was mm. pushed for probably two decades. But by the year 2000, that correlation had, had, had separated. CO2 was still rising, temperatures plateaued. And then we had a change from Lama's cry of uh, catastrophic global warming to climate change, which is a bit innocuous because climate change as a term hides behind it a lot of natural variation uh, sort of um, is underlying the whole operation, but they keep focusing climate change all derives by human activity. So it's been sort of, say, uh, disingenuous to the public uh, by that change from uh, catastrophic global warming to just that banner of climate change. So part, part of the problem with it is that initially people started to get concerned because they could see that the climate was getting warmer. Things were warming. The earth was getting hotter. And they then started to have a look around to see what could cause this. And what they came up with is the greenhouse effect, that greenhouse gases, CO2 and some of the others are preventing heat escaping so easily as their uh, concentrations increase. And that's warming the earth up. But they couldn't find any other explanation for the warming. And so they got very enthusiastic about that one. But no, what no one seems to have grasped or taken much notice is, is that the earth is warming because it's emerging from a glacial event to warmer conditions that existed in the past. And we're heading, uh, we're warming because we are trying to re-establish those warmer temperatures and climatic conditions that existed in the past. And we haven't reached them yet. The warming I remember is, as a know, kid, I remember as a kid in the 70s, 
panic was nice age is coming really? and and there was a there was multiple headlines in multiple papers right across the world about fear of another ice age being upon us because we went we gone from the 1940s which had, was a fairly warm period and sort of and, and by the 70s it was a, a general drop away in temperature so that, cor that temperature drop for that period was sparking some fear that we're going back into an ice age but then around about 1976 we got that up up pick up and that sort of alleviated that fear and then we went from fear of being frozen to death to a scientist creating a fear we're going to be boiled to death like frogs the pot yes there's a fair amount of confusion as to uh, what's driving the warming from greenhouse gases driving it and their man-made component in particular is of concern there but there seems to be totally ignoring the fact that for most of earth history the average mean global temperature of the earth was four or five degrees warmer than it is today and we're trying to establish or to re-establish that warmer temperature condition following our emergence from the last glacial event the earth if we've come out of a glaciation event we must increase in temperature because things are warming and it's warming back to a long-term natural warmer condition that existed through most of geological time of three or four or more degrees warmer than today we haven't reached it yet or we might be getting close the other thing is too from those sawtooth patterns over the hundred thousand years we're basically at a peak of that sawtooth that lasts probably 15 to 20,000 years, and then it can drop away again into a, another glacial period. Those glacial periods operate somewhere between 70, 70 80,000 years, where it's cooler, compared to the peak and the plateau that we're on now, it lasts for somewhere between 15 and 20,000 years. And all I can say is, thank heavens we live in an interglacial period. But we survived, if you look at that, uh, that chart of uh, early man, we survived into the last glacial period. So it was pretty miserable, and, uh, but humanoids and, and Neanderthals and early humans, uh, Homo sapiens, could survive those conditions. It was tough, but we, 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 we could have clothing, have fire, build good structures, and so on. Civilization was driven in part by trying to be able to avoid the cold. But the other, <laughs> other difference, the difference between now and then is there's a smaller number of humanoids and they had the ability to move over a landmass and get away from the cold. Now with 7 billion people on the planet, most of them living in temperate climates, you know, North America, Canada, North, Northern Europe, Northern Asia, there's quite a, quite a big population of people. If we go back into a glacial period, where we get a kilometre of, of ice sheet over Canada and and North America and, and Northern Europe and Asia, there's a lot, a lot a lot of people will have to retreat out of there because it's not going to be much food production in those sort of areas. So. Going into that, if we go, when we go back into that glacial period, there's going to be some, some disruption. Well, at some stage, we will descend back into, we'll go off one of the uh, saw, sawtooth peaks and we'll drop down into the cooling side of that peak, uh, which happens. And th then we'll, that will be pretty serious. And it's on the cards at some stage that will happen, provided there's no other major changes in the universe uh, to, to correct it or the solar system. So we're going to enter, we should be entering a cooling event now because we are past or at the peak warming for those zigzag patterns. It should now descend back down into cooler conditions. The interesting thing about those zigzag patterns is the warming side of the zigzag is very short and warms very quickly and the cooling side of the zigzag is very gentle slope so it cools very slowly so this stretching of the ellipse and contraction of the orbital ellipse is rapid uh, and, uh, contraction to produce warming but slower extension to produce the cooling not sure what 
what that influence is. It's not symmetrical, it's asymmetrical. So cooling is more rapid than, sorry, warming is more rapid than cooling in those sorting patterns. Don't understand that. Okay, then we'll leave it there for the night, Robert. Thanks very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Um, may come Thank back you. in another another few months or so, another conversation, um, because I think the debate as we get, as government policy runs into things like zero emissions by 2050 and all and the expense that comes with it i'm sure that sure there's a there's another uh, conversation in, in that as well so we'll leave it there tonight thank you robert okay. for, for your thank time you. thank you very much if you enjoyed tonight's show please like follow and, and share to facebook and also subscribe to, to our youtube next week Joining me will be Professor David Flint, and we'll be talking on constitutional issues and the, and the power responsibilities of state and federal governments within the Federation, especially in light of the COVID situation we've had over the last 18 months and the general feeling that the states have too much power. And there have been calls by some commentators and some politicians, the abolition of the states. We will discuss that and other matters in that conversation. So join me again next week at the same time.